believe similar situations exist in America today because for four decades the body of Christ has watched mostly in silence. As Bishop Duncan said earlier today, as the voice of the church and the laws have been progressively legislated out of the public arena. Hinduism and rationalism rule in the land as we as Americans and those that are listening across seas worship at the altars of greed, materialism, and selfishness. I believe this afternoon that we have an opportunity to proclaim and declare with one voice what we as apostolic believers stand for. One anchor said yesterday that they have been to every uh, denominal organization, that they are able to come together at a phone call to discuss issues and then come out of their meetings with a proclamation stating this is what the Catholic Church stands for, this is what the Church of God in Christ Church stands for, this is what the Methodist Church stands for. I believe that it is time for the Apostolic Church to not remain quiet. It is time for us to speak with a loud voice. Could you help us with just a, a little history? Can you tell us how did the various apostolic organizations start? How did they start? The various um, organization of the apostolic movement of our day, um, as you say, we have to go back a bit to the noticeable Zuzer Street mission that was prompted primarily by Parham in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas. And then, of course, he closed his school then to Topeka and went to Texas and Houston, Texas and preached his message there. And Seymour heard it, sent it out in the hallway, and then somebody from Los Angeles invited Seymour to come and, of course, um, to preach at the Nicerine Church. And, of course, he preached about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the next night, he founded the church with Padlock. And then, of course, he was put out of that connection and went to a brother's house on Bon and Bray Street and continued his teaching and preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And of course, they moved to Azusa Street, 312 Azusa Street. And for three and a half years, that revival went on without stopping day and night in an abandoned Methodist uh, building, church building, a black and white. Mexican and all different nationality came. And then, of course, in 1913, uh, Frank Ewart and McAllister got the revelation about the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1914, the Assembly of God started their organization in Hot Spring, Arkansas, when it broke a loose away from what those people, they say, have come into the area of the new issue. And then that began what we call the apostolic movement as of uh, today and its roots. And of course, in 1919, the PFW took the name of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World that they first received in 1906 as the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. But they took the apostolic mantle and continued that legacy. And I think in 1919, of course, Bishop uh, Lawson started his organization um, in the eastern portion over the doctrine of uh, whether the woman had the right to preach and her head covering. So that's separated from the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. 1924, Bishop um, Haywood was announced to become the first presiding bishop of the Pentecostal Assembly of the World. When I say first, of a presiding bishop, they used to be called superintendents, but they went to the Episcopal uh, governmental function in the Pentecostal assemblies of the world. That became a major split for some reason or the other between the white and the blacks in 1924, and an organization uh, that were mostly white was established, and then of course, Bishop Haywood died in 1931, and then when Bishop Haywood died, then they came together to establish a 
um, PHAC Church, the Pentecostal Church of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, because of the Jim Crow laws that was in the southern states, they did not allow the blacks to come down there to worship with them because they did not allow black and white to mingle together. So the black was offended. And then, of course, in 1932, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World was reestablished and they continued their particular charter. 1945, if I'm correct, the UPC churches began getting the Pentecostal churches. And then, of course, the, um, whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, from time to time, there have been various uh, splits, or it wouldn't necessarily be split, but somebody get an idea to start an organization to function under various name. In 1957, the PCAF uh, was founded by Bishop S. N. Hancock and also by Bishop Willie Lee. And then, of course, after the PCAF was established and that set up, an effort was made, of course, to bring the churches back together. And of course, when Bishop uh, Hancock died, Bishop Lee of Soon, the presiding bishop connection of the Pentecostal Assemblies, um, um, the PCFAF, the Pentecostal Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, Pentecostal Church of the Apostolic Faith. And of course, it became a split there on the one point of who should become the presiding bishop. And then, of course, uh, Bishop Lee had the charter of that particular functioning. And then, of course, a split off came in that particular point where they started what they called the Pentecostal Churches of the Apostolic Faith International. And then, of course, the continuation of the Pentecostal Assemblies of, uh, of the Pentecostal uh, Churches of the Apostolic Faith continued under Bishop, um, after Bishop Hancock died, under the Bishop Young in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Right. And then of course the PCFAF International um, went into another functioning and starting what we call the Emmanuel Church of the God of the Bishop um, Nathaniel Matten. And I forget the name of his, uh, his uh, overseer at that time. But, and then of course, when things went in different direction and not knowing which way to go and such and such, Bishop Jim Boom, he's sitting right here, uh, came together in Michigan, and he was the chairman of the Michigan State Council. And so therefore, we established what is called the Apostolic Assemblies of Christ, uh, which is, uh, is one of the founding organizations that I was a charter and am a charter member of the Apostolic Assemblies of Christ. And I told Bishop Boom, a lot of the one that even coming out from there is still his children and grandchildren whom he had uh, birthed into organizationalism in a certain point of emphasis. And then, of course, the AWCF was established in 1970. Uh, and of course, now we have today in the apostolic movement this beautiful gathering that you have that we're sitting in today uh, for the purpose to start again the effort to fulfill what Jesus' prayer was in the 17th chapter of St. John to make them one. And the last deal before the Lord come back that must be fulfilled yeah. as in Ephesians 4 and 11. Right. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some uh, pastors and teachers for the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the, of the body of Christ until, until we all come unto the unity of the faith unto the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind and doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive but we can grow up to that spiritual house. Need to be blessed and changed through the impactful teachings of Bishop William L. Harris IV.